Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Abba, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Abba, for the power of the resurrection. All you did, all you did in love. Father, it is my prayer this morning that every heart will be open to receive of your truth. Being instructed of your word, being sensitive more than ever before to who you are in their lives, Lord. Father, I thank you for an imprint, a mark upon their very souls today. And that no one leaves this place the same way they came. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn your Bibles this morning to the book of Hebrews in chapter 2. Hebrews in chapter 2. I titled this message, What Manner of Love? What Manner of Love? Hebrews in chapter 2, our text for this morning. Again, by way of pastoral injunction, these have all cell phones, pads, electronic devices, silenced. And where there may be doubts about that or concerns about that, turned off, switched off Amen. for this moment in time. Hebrews in chapter 2 from verse 5. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a sudden place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see all things put under him. But we see Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Another version says, might taste death for every man, for all people. Verse 10, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. We must understand that the captain of our salvation here implicated or pointed to or spoken about concerns the one who was and is in very nature God. What do I mean by that? It highlights this, spells this out in Hebrews in chapter 1, just the chapter before. Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1. God who in various times and various means or at Sunday times and in diverse manners spoke unto the fathers by the prophets in these last days he has spoken. He has spoken through his son, Jesus. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. I want us to see that. I want us to 
catch that reality. Another version says, who being the radiance of God's glory, speaking of Jesus, speaking concerning Jesus, who being the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Goes on to say, after he had by himself purged our sins, did something, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The selfsame one Jesus by whom and through whom all things were created. Through whom all things were made. Purged our sins and sat down. Yes, him, this man, we see Jesus. Made it a little lower than the angels. For what purpose? To what end? It says for the suffering of what? Of death. Why? Because the eternal purpose of God was that Jesus, was that Christ should taste death for everyone, for every man. And this Jesus did as the sinless, spotless lamb. Set off, spoken of in John 1, 29, John 1, 29, Behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin, the sin of the world, Jesus. This is amazing grace. What we could not do in and of ourselves, what we could not achieve in and of ourselves by works or good deeds, however they may seem <laughs> or look or feel, all worthless, like filthy rags, actually the book says. For it was fitting, verse 10, Hebrews 2.10, for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in doing what? In bringing many sons to glory. We've got to know and, and keep before our very eyes the heart of Abba, the heart of the Father in sending his son. The aim to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The sufferings which Jesus endured, the sufferings which he went through, that which he experienced in his body, in his flesh, all led up to and culminated in the suffering of death. Why? So that you and I, so that all of us who believe in Jesus, who believe in that finished work, be made sons in glory. The way John puts it, 1 John 3, 1, he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be what? The sons of God. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God and indeed and in truth that is what you are on the basis of faith in Jesus on the basis of faith in his death and resurrection and glorious ascension the manner of the love the manner of the lavish is the giving up of his son so that anyone who believes by faith become his. Become, from the portion we just read in Hebrews 2, become a part of one. Belong to God, now become, belong to God, now belong in his family as members of his household, of his kingdom. Jesus paid the price in full. The Father so loved the world, we know this well, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He so loved, the Father so loved, he gave his Son. The Son came on the scene. 
and so loved to the extent that he gave his life. He gave his life for you. And we've got to see this and understand this and recognize this as being personal. Having been called into relationship with him, having been called into oneness with him, having been called into his family, belonging to his household. John 15, 12, John 15, 12, and verse 13. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13, greater love has no man than this. And a man give his life, lay down his life, lay down one's life for his friends. Make no mistake about it, it was love that motivated, that was the motivation in all that Jesus did. In going through the suffering, in going through the suffering, it was love that served as the basis, filled his heart was who he was. John 13, 1. John 13, 1. Put it in this wise. In a nutshell, as soon as he realized, okay, the time of his sojourn here on earth was about to come to an end, it says something to the effect of he did what? That it was time to depart from this world. Having loved his own who were in the world, he did what? He loved them to the end. Again, I stress, it was love, for example, in that garden in Gethsemane. It was love that moved Jesus to speak words that till today, every time I read, still <sighs> does something in my heart. As with all the word, but in Mark 14 and 36, Mark 14, 36, it jumps out so real. Jesus says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup. From me. Just for us to understand the, not just the significance of the hour of that moment, but the enormity of it. It was love that made him respond. Nevertheless, it was love that made him respond. Nevertheless, not my will, but what? Your will. common parlance, not my will, but let yours be done. Love. Love. Abba, Father, endearment, love, as with his father. You know, Let's do some, let's do some reading. I want us to see certain things this morning as we go on in this service. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew in chapter 26. Matthew in 26. Verse 66. At this point, he's been arrested. At this point, a summary tribunal put together before the religious leaders of the day, the Sanhedrin, to be more specific, on a charge of, we see it in 65, his spoken blasphemy. 
in 66, they answered and said, based on what he said, they answered and said, he is deserving of what? Death. Summary conclusion. Summary judgment concerning Jesus. He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands. And before Pilate, Jesus before Pilate, just flip over Matthew 27, 27, 24. Matthew 27, 24. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it, because the clamor and the cry, if you look at it from verse 12, the clamor and the cry was what? Crucify him. Crucify him. What does Pilate do? <laughs> and all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, and when he had flogged him, had him beating, he delivered him to be crucified. This was no ordinary type of scourging. If you have an idea of the Roman scourge, and what that entailed. The whip with the leather straps, however a number of those straps were, that had attached to them, fastened to them, metal balls, bones, nails, indented pieces of metal, Consider every lash given to our Lord Jesus. Their body. His arteries and veins exposed from the pull of every lash. With skin attached to all those various things I just mentioned. How gory that was. What he had to endure over and over and over again. Blood loss, if you can imagine it. The shock that his body is going through. The shock that he's experiencing. What about his organs? What's happening to those? Kidneys, lungs. As he's being brutally whipped. To a state and a stage where he is beyond, truthfully, beyond recognition. As far as human beings go. He's losing bodily fluids. His, his condition, saints, friends, family, is critical way before the seven inch nails are viciously and brutally nailed in. To his hands and his feet. And joined together way before that the sufferings what he went through for what make no mistake about it when we hear Isaiah, Isaiah speak about this in Isaiah 53 it's not about any sin that he had committed why? Because he's without sin. No gal was found in his mouth, sinless, spotless. But what he took upon himself was that we pertain to humanity as far as sin goes, in dealing with the sin issue, in dealing with that nature. 
in dealing with death. So I'll cut for time. I'll cut the aspects of being descriptive, but he's on that cross, impaled, nailed. It was love that kept him there. Love kept him there. So many times I look at him, people get me and say, oh, if you're the Lord, you're who you say you are, come down. Do you think he could have? Do you for any one moment doubt that he could have? But in loving obedience to his father and because of the joy, for the joy that was set before him, the Bible says he did what he endured the cross, despised the shame. Why? So that you and I, so that all of you, so that all of us can be brought into a place of union with him, oneness with him, being reconciled, being restored by faith in Jesus, by faith in this work, by faith in the perfect sacrifice, the substitution. So in essence, what kept him there was love, yes, and it was for sinful humanity. Not anything that he did. Not anything that he did. Love and obedience to the Father's will led him to undergo the most horrific suffering imaginable as a substitute. The perfect. This culminated, friends, saints, in him after taking the sour wine or sour wine. In John 19 and 30, saying, it is finished. It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And he was buried. And we know that death could not hold him captive. And we know that death could not hold him captive. We know that the enemy <laughs> had no, he didn't, it's not like he had one up on Jesus in no way, shape, or form. Why? Because on that first day of the week, something happens. Matthew 28, if you're there, Matthew 28, 26. I want us to see this. We hear this ever so often and we, we spout it and we talk about it, but let's read. Matthew 28, verse 6. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary head to the tomb. Forget about the earthquake and everything going on and what the guards and what's happening to the guards, whether they're collapsing or fainting or whatever is happening to them. Oh, this angel appears on the scene and says, he is not here, for he is risen. Come, 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 come. See the place where the Lord lay. See, 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 see. Why? This thing was not done in a corner. This thing of which we speak, his death, his burial, and his resurrection occurred as a fact, occurred as reality in time. But we do not speak concerning fables or old wives' tales. When we speak concerning Jesus and what he endured. In his passion. No. No. And I stood there this morning and I could scarcely contain myself, compose myself. I don't, I don't even know what words to use. I'm encouraging each and every one of you always keep the cross, always keep the sacrifice before your very eyes. This is not to be relegated to a once a week or once a year, sorry, once a year, remembrance, occurrence, celebration. Your whole life should be spent celebrating 
what Jesus did and who you are on the basis of that finished work as a victor, as one who's made righteous, as one who's been justified, as one who is now holy, as one who's washed, cleansed, who's been made one with God, with Abba, having his spirit, having his life, being an overcomer, being a victor, being victorious, being more than conqueror, possessing eternal life. My Lord, what love is this that paid so dearly that I, the guilty one, may go. sacrifice the son of God given for me my debt he paid and my death he died that I my live that I died to death so that you could live. The living is not limited to, oh, I'm alive, I'm alive as a human being in the sphere of time for a moment, what is just a moment in time, whether you live to be 100 or you live to be 120. It's not just about that. We have to realize in putting our hearts and setting our hearts on his death and on his resurrection, we have to recognize the reality which Paul describes in Romans in chapter 6, verse 4. In Romans in chapter 6, verse 4. A powerful reality, most wondrous reality to which we've been ushered by way of faith, in which we've been ushered by way of identification with Jesus and the work of the cross, the finished work of the cross. Therefore, we're buried with him through baptism into death. For what purpose? More pertinently, more importantly, for what purpose? That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also, we also should walk in what? In newness of life. We also should walk in newness of life. The newness of life here speaks in first degree, attaches to concerns. First of all, the understanding, the realization of that which is called eternal life, which is what you received and when you believe, which is what you will receive when you believe. Eternal life as nature, as life that subsists in your being, in the here and now. Eternal life doesn't speak concerning or point to, oh, in the, in the, in the sweet by and by. Or some was out in the afterlife or whatnot. It doesn't just, no, it's not just about that. It's not just about living forever. It's about having the nature and the very life of God, the way of God inside you. Newness of life starts with that. That seed within. You recognize that, realize that, okay. I'm a new creation, righteous, holy. And with that understanding, 
you walk in that reality. Newness of life. And I've said on the basis of the past couple of messages, I've said this. On the basis of that life, based on that life is why you are victorious. Based on that life is why you are an overcomer. Before anything in this life, before whether you get the world's goods or don't have the world's goods, before whether your account is chock full of money and funds or not, before anything that relates to, concerns, or touches on the material, as far as can be seen or contemplated in the sphere of this life, this world. It has an impact on it, recognizing the seed, recognizing that life. Recognizing that nature speaks of eternal life. It's about eternal life lived out in the life of the disciple, in the life of the believer, in the life of one who has called Jesus Lord, Savior, Master, and King. Giving expression to that in your daily walk, in your daily life. This is the abundant life. This is what Jesus said, come to give them life and that what? More abundantly. Suppose there's supposed to be an impingement. You have this life, you have this nature, there's an outworking of it. You are victorious by nature, having been joined to God, being one in him and with him. It's supposed to have an outflow, a show. Someone say show. In your life. A display. A display. We don't have time to get in there. Put down Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. I had a great time in the class, in Romans class today. Right? Yeah. But by grace are you saved through faith. Right? Yeah. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It says, well, as workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. That he had before ordained that we should walk in them. There's a lot there, but you must walk, I must walk in newness of life. Have you received this new life? You're here sitting this morning. Do you have newness of life? Do you have eternal life? Do you know that you have eternal life? Are you born after God in righteousness and true holiness? Have you been born from above? Are you saved? Something to ponder and think on. All who say, yep, got new life, have eternal life. How do you do newness of life effectively? How do you walk this walk on the basis of new life that you have within you in an effective way and manner on this earthly plane? To walk in newness of life, which is a walk of victory, a life, I was going to use the word punctuated, but attended by victory, left, right, center, by by. Overcoming in substance, left, right, center for your walk in every aspect, in your relationships, in your homes, with your children, with your parents, with grandchildren, at work, on the job, with colleagues, with, 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 with classmates, with, with those in authority and government, everywhere, in every sphere. How do you do this? How do you do this? I'll mention three quick ways before we close. Newness of life in expression, newness of life in the walk, having impact. I'm going to put it in this way. Three quick things. Number one. Mm, thank you, Holy Spirit. Number one. Simply this. Set your heart. Set your mind. Set your affections on God 
himself. Time, First John 2.15, you can put it down, First John 2.15. It says, love not the world. Love not the world. Love not the world. It says, for if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Love not the world, its trappings, the lure, the allure, sets your hearts and your mind on God as your focus. There's a lot I can say about the world, what's occurring now in the world, and this nation, our country, and the world over, if we were to dive into that some, I guess I may hit some of that next week, but Set your hearts on God himself. Keeping in heart, keeping in mind, Isaiah 26, 3, Isaiah 26, 3, that he will keep, he keeps in what? In perfect peace. Those whose hearts are stayed where? On him. Anchored in him, focused in, on him, and in him, rooted. As you trust in him. That shows your trust, shows your dependence. That it's on him, not on the world, not what you can get from the world. I guess I didn't, we didn't get to that earlier on. Verse 16 of 1 John 2. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. What you have, what you've acquired, your possessions, everything. What, who you are, the tag on your name, academia, or whatever it is. All that you possess and all that you chase after. All those things, not of the Father of this world. Zone in on him. In what way? Number two. Point number two. Newness of life. In what way? Know his love. Know his love. Have your heart centered in on him. Know God's love. God loves you. God loves you, you sitting there, staring at me so intently. God loves you. Know this for certainty. Know this with every assuredness. Know, understand, appreciate, recognize the reality that God loves you. And that nothing changes that. Say, Pastor, did you just say that? Pastor, did you just say nothing? I, I did. If you have questions about that, personally, in personal capacity, you can see me. And we can talk to him, but I have to, I have to be very considerate of everyone today, specifically and particularly. Okay? But you can see me. When I say no is love, this goes beyond you considering your situation or circumstance. And say, well, oh yeah, I know he loves me because all my needs are met. I know he loves me because I have everything I need. I've acquired what I'm doing, what I'm involved with, my relationships, everything is going smoothly. So yes, I know he loves me. Question for you, what if? What if everything is not going smoothly? What happens when relationships that you have that are so, I mean, so, so, so important and vital in your life as with kids or children, as with family, as with a spouse, what happens when, uh, if that relationship is like, is rocky or is in more words than none, non-existent? What if the account is empty and the bills are stacking up? Will you, on that basis, and the basis of much more things that I know, challenges that we may be facing in our different places and spaces and spheres, will you on that basis say, oh, I don't really know about his love. Does he really love me? Yes. Know his love beyond things, materials, people, life, circumstances, all of that, and then some. Know that he loves you. 
get to know his love, move, transcend to the sphere and the space of experiencing his love, knowing his love experientially. As between father and child. It goes beyond things. Why am I saying this, Pastor? You're hitting this, Pastor. Why? Because it's possible that in this life, regardless of where you may be, that you find and are able to point to someone else in this world who has more stuff than you. Who's got more riches, boku boku riches, that you can, the word riches don't even begin to describe what they got. But they don't know God. But they don't have eternal life. They don't have the invisible seed of God. His nature, his spirit, so they don't have it within them. And when them point is, oh, yeah, that person is favored. We have to watch it. And say, oh, I'm favored, I'm favored. Not based, the antecedent is not based on things. That means it's not about things. It's not about people and spheres. It's about what? Relationship. The oneness you have with God, having been given access to him. And I t tend to frequently ask this question. What are you doing with your access to God? 24-7 access is so, is so, is so, no, not inhibited in any way, shape, or form. It's so real. Are you spending time in communion and fellowship with him one-on-one -on -one basis where time pales, where time just, oh, it's just 15 minutes study. I got to go. You're lost in his presence, in his word, being rooted and grounded in who he is. Knowing his love. Get to know his love. This takes tarrying. We're such in a hurry. We're on the go. Life is fast paced. In fact, compared to 20, 30 years ago, it is now super fast paced, super charged. So, oh, oh, I can't hear him. I can't hear the Lord. I can't hear the Lord. Well, maybe you're going at extreme what? Can you pause a little? And say, Father, what's your heart? Father, concerning this matter that is so prevailing out there in the world, pushing in universities, pushing in culture, pushing everywhere, what does your word say? And, and, and you get rooted and grounded in this, not based on the basis of what pastor told you. Pastor Shion, <laughs> no sir, no ma'am. It's imperative that you, for you, by yourself, in tandem with the Holy Ghost, Get in the word. See truth. See reality. I want to cha no, challenge, I want to encourage you to be here next week. Be here next week. Because there's a whole lot more to be said. Walking in newness of life and seeing victory follow you everywhere, trailing you and, and all of that. It starts from that place where you realize and recognize on the basis of his love. Guess what? It's about you and him in that communion, in that fellowship. When you know by the word, in spite of what you're going through or experiencing, one, for example, God is faithful. First Corinthians 1 9. Did you hear me say that regardless, capital letters, capital lies, of what I may be going through, possibly my body right now as I'm standing before you, or you sitting there and looking at me beyond what you may be going through, that God is faithful by which and by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son Jesus. That you're not judging him by saying, Lord, are you really good because... I stepped out, I tried to do something and it didn't happen, or I wanted something and it didn't happen, or I got this and I lost it. And there are so many permutations that we can draw up, knowing from his word that God is good. Psalm 118, verse 1, 118, verse 27, 29. And he is good. And no amount of circumstances or life situations would get you to shift from that in which you've been rooted and grounded. How about you are so good? loving because he 
loves you. He doesn't just have love. God doesn't just have love. God is what? Love. 1 John 4, 8. 1 John 4, 8. God is love. It's part of his essence and his essential nature. That's who he is. All right. Point three, because of time, is just love him. Love the Lord. Love God. You say, Pastor, all these three things, yes, maybe from the same to you or whatnot, but it's about love. The love he showed displayed by the cross. First, before anything you can begin to mention as far as material in this life. Because he took care of you forever. Eternal life being a present actual possession, having effect for life that now is and that which is to come. No joke. He took care of it. He took care of you. He loves you. Love him. I was going to say love him right back, but love him continually. Would you stand every soul? Just hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you. <laughs> we love you because you first loved us. You first loved us. We love you. Thank you, Lord, for capacity. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for the nature of love which we carry within. And that we're able to fellowship and commune with you on a platform that no man could have devised. But you did in bringing us into nearness in relationship, bringing us into oneness in you. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your, the integrity of who you are. Thank you, Lord, because no amount of... <sighs> nothing in this life, in totality or summation, put together that we experience, feel, go through, walk through, all of that put together not enough as sufficient evidence to prove that you're not faithful because you are faithful Abba you are good you're loving and you're kind thank you for the cross thank you for Jesus thank you for redemption in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches I pray that more and more in an increasing way the eyes of understanding will be enlightened to the reality and truth of who you are and of your love the love of Christ it surpasses all knowing Father thank you I was getting to walk in this reality more and more experientially and just seeing your favor upon our lives for everyone here. Is there anyone here you don't know Jesus? You know, express faith in him and the work. You've not said yes to him as Lord, Savior, Master, and King in and over your life, specifically and particularly you. Would you be so bold as to indicate say yes to his call yes to his knocking on your heart to say yes to say yes say pastor you spoke about eternal life this life newness of life I say yes in faith and in believing is that you this morning this afternoon is that you here, you say concerning your love Abba concerning love or a deeper revelation or a deeper knowing or a deeper understanding or a deeper experience of you in sweet communion and fellowship, is that you? in this place would you just indicate by lifting your right hand if that's you say, Lord, more. Say more. To 
know you, to know your love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, I thank you for these ones with their hands raised. Father, I thank you for the, an awakening in our hearts in an ever-increasing way, Abba, of the great love with which you loved them. An awakening to your love like never before. An awakening to who you are. Thank you, Lord. That these ones, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height. To know the love of your son, Jesus, that passes all knowing. Thank you, Father, for intimacy and experience. Father, I thank you. I give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Lord, for this house and everyone here present, Father, I thank you for all that you did and accomplished by the cross. Causing them to be victors. Having life prayer that each and every one continues in an ever-increasing way to walk in newness of life, knowing who they are in you and who you are in them, and experiencing breakthroughs, experiencing change, experiencing transformation in different levels and different aspects, that they thrive as overcomers in this life. All to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Keep his love before your eyes, before your hearts, and keep loving on him. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Have a glorious week, everyone. <laughs>